To the Catholic, material realities are means to the experience of transcendence. God came to us in the flesh of the Messiah, and the Messiah remains with us in the flesh in bread and wine. In both solitary and corporate prayer, our petitions ascend in a mystery of the Spirit, but they are often, if not ordinarily, carried heavenward with the help of a rich sensory experience, the smell of incense, the sound of the organ, and perhaps most of all, the sight of a statue or a painting. Speaking to a meeting of artists in the Sistine Chapel in 2009, Pope Benedict XVI evoked Plato, reminding his audience, quote, an essential function of genuine beauty is that it gives man a healthy shock. It draws him out of himself, wrenches him away from resignation and from being content with humdrum. It even makes him suffer, piercing him like a dart. But in so doing, it reawakens him, opening afresh the eyes of his heart and mind, giving him wings, carrying him aloft. Anyone who has looked up at the very ceiling of the room where our late pontiff made his remarks can attest to the power of the painted image to do everything he describes. By contrast, many of us identify a certain soullessness in the blank walls of office spaces, or a sad unseriousness about the kitsch of advertisements on billboards, television, or the internet. Likewise, some expressions of modern art, like Marcel Duchamp's urinal sculpture or Tracy Eamon's unmade bed exhibition, may serve to shock us, but in no way do they elevate our souls. Clearly, the Christian painter is needed now more than ever. And their images of humane subjects, including depictions of the saints, belong in abundance not only in our churches and in our public spaces, but in our homes. Sadly, there is a perception that great religious art is a thing of the past, and that people simply are not trained anymore in the methods that once gave us masterpieces like the Ghent altarpiece or the Virgin on the Rocks. In fact, great Catholic painters are out there if you know where to look. To help us discover the riches of the Catholic artistic tradition at work today, Ignatius Press has assembled paintings from nine artists in a unique new book called The Catholic Home Gallery, 18 works by contemporary Catholic artists. Edited by John Harried and featuring a foreword by Emily Stimson Chapman, the book contains 18 portraits done in a variety of styles and with a variety of materials. And the unique part is that each print may be easily removed by a perforated edge and framed for display in whatever environment an individual or family may see fit. Among the nine painters whose work is featured in the book is my guest today. Gwyneth Thompson Briggs earned a BFA at the Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design, and she holds advanced degrees in physics and engineering. She paints with the special techniques of the Renaissance and Baroque eras. Gwyneth believes not only in restoring the beauty of worship to God, but also in the charitable act of creating and sharing work with our neighbors. In 2017, Gwyneth was asked to produce a work for Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, a portrait of St. Augustine. Gwyneth Thompson Briggs lives in St. Louis, Missouri with her husband and children, and it is my pleasure to welcome her to the show. Gwyneth Thompson Briggs, welcome to the Ignatius Press Podcast. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm really delighted to get to talk to you today, Gwyneth, because this is a this is a special book and a unique book that we're going to talk about, um, which uh, isn't really like any of the other books that I've had the opportunity to review and read closely and uh, and talk about with our guests. So, the book that we're talking about is called "The Catholic Home Gallery: Eighteen Works of Art by Contemporary Catholic Artists." 
There are nine artists featured in the book and you are one of them. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your art background. Uh, well, I'm a professional sacred artist and um, my husband and I sort of launched our family business about four years ago. And in the past four years, uh, I've been incredibly blessed to create altar pieces and works for private devotion and just really get a lot of practice. So um, I, I feel really fortunate. Very few artists are able to um, paint as much as I do and have the patronage to make that happen. So um, uh, a big part of my mission now is to kind of spread the word and encourage young artists to pursue their vocation so that they can um, help contribute to beauty in the world. Do you do you use yourself as an example for young artists as, as someone, I, I would imagine there are a lot of people up and coming who think to themselves, I would love to be a creative person. I would love to be a professional creative person, but is there a way to actually make a living doing it? Is the world even going to appreciate what I spend my, pour my soul into as it were? Yeah, well, you know, I think that there's this kind of false stability that comes with working for someone, uh, you know, maybe like a large engineering firm. Um, I had tried to be an engineer myself, but was quite unhappy because that wasn't what I was called to do. And um, when you have your own business, you know, whether it's, you know, being a plumber, being an artist, um, you're just much more aware of uh, how much you depend on God. And um, it's his providence that provides for your family. Um, that said, I think that there's a lot of practical measures that creative individuals have to be aware of um, when it comes to uh, sort of uh, making sure that you spend enough time doing taxes and marketing and all these things that are antithetical to the, uh, the creative artistic type, if you will. Um, so I was fortunate enough to uh, uh, marry a man who actually takes care of a lot of um, the the more arduous tasks of running an art business, um, such as uh, bookkeeping and taxes. And I get to do a lot of the fun stuff of painting. But um, for most artists, you kind of have to have a split personality. And um, unfortunately, that's just kind of the, the reality. Yeah. Well, it, what a blessing that you have this arrangement where you get to you get to offer your gifts and you get to make a living and you get to um, share also in a partnership with your husband, the, this endeavor, that that sounds like a real blessing. Let me, uh, let me ask you, Gwyneth. So this book, The Catholic Home Gallery, as I mentioned, it's a really, it's a really unique book. And we'll talk about several reasons why. One of the reasons why is that the, the 18 paintings by the nine painters that are in the book are detachable by a perforation so that, um, people who buy the book can actually remove the, the paintings that they like best, the prints of the paintings and, and hang them up in your homes. Have you heard from anyone? And I want to talk about the specifics of your paintings, but have you heard from anyone that now your work is, is on, is on people's walls because, because of the book, or do you think people will, will do that? Yeah. And um, you know, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for original art because really when you see just a photograph of an image or a print, you're really only experiencing maybe 10% of that work of art because it's divorced from its original scale, the, the medium with which it's constructed. But it serves as this wonderful echo that I hope can help spur people on to recognize the beauty and power of art. Um, the most, I think my, my favorite use of um, the prints thus far um, uh, a woman told me that she had put prints of Benedict and Scholastica in her children's bedroom to help promote uh, sibling harmony. And uh, I thought that was such a good idea. I'm considering it myself. But uh, yeah, those are the, the paintings that I have in the, the Catholic Home Gallery in this edition. Yes, the, they're, and they're really two of my favorites, I have to admit, from the, from the book. And I want to get into where they came from. But first I was wondering, um, you know, so you've uh, just perusing your website, you've, you've produced a lot of, a lot of really wonderful work. How did you get connected with this project? Uh, where did you know, I, I know John Harried was kind of behind collecting the, the, you know, putting together the collection. Uh, how, how did you get involved? 
Well, you know, it's just remarkable what a small world uh, Catholic publishing is and Catholic um, uh, lovers of, of art and books and music. Um, I actually don't know how, uh, how John and I got in contact, but I feel like I've always been in admiration of, you know, some of the covers he's designed and um, the publications at Ignatius. And um, I, just a few years ago, I started uh, doing some marketing on Twitter. And I know that um, we've been able to, to keep more in touch with what each other's projects are. So that might have been the connection there. Well, it's, it, I'm sure each artist whose work ended up in the book has a, has a unique story about how, how um, he or she got connected to John or to Ignatius or, or came onto the radar of, of, in this world of, of yes. Catholic art. Which, and maybe we could just pause there and talk about that world for a moment. You know, I, I, there are times when I, I, I think the perception out in the culture is that the age of producing great religious art is past. Mm -hmm. um, that there are certainly things that, you know, people can produce things now and that's fine. Um, but that, that true greatness is, is something, uh, something gone. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, I, I think that there's something to that. I do wonder if we're going to produce another Michelangelo, right, in, in our day today. But I, I also think most of the people who, who make those kinds of claims just aren't paying much attention or aren't looking hard enough for those talented creators who are out there. Is that, is that something that you, that you think about, talk about, that you're concerned about? Yeah, absolutely. Because, um, you know, I feel like I'm always trying to make up for lost time. Um, it was really hard to find training uh, to become a professional artist. And I just made a lot of just foolish mistakes with materials and techniques. And so when I meet young people, I say, let me tell you about this so that you can build on the tradition. And that's what's happened. That's the problem is that there's been a total rupture of tradition. And with art making, unlike a lot of other fields, I think it's absolutely essential that it be passed down in person. You have to see the master craftsmen, how they mix their paints, the amount of drying time. You know, it's so tactile that when people become separated, when everything happens via computer um, or um, uh, via, with any type of like technology that's um, preventing people from connecting, it breaks down um, this extraordinary body of knowledge. We've already lost so many secrets from the Renaissance, from the Baroque, that uh, we're really in this area of both rediscovery and then also building upon that tradition. Um, so I'd say um, nowadays there's a, a number of foes for the professional uh, artist and um, not the least of which is, is technology that offers this temptation of AI art everything's easy, it looks splashy right off the bat, but when you look close, um, it lacks uh, the integrity and the beauty that comes with sacrifice. It certainly does. I mean, it, you, you'd really just have to not know, you, you, you would really have to just have a brain so conditioned by living in this or swimming in this sea of technology, not to understand what you're looking at when you see something that is produced painstakingly by hand, like the real kind of material reality versus something that's just produced on a computer, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and I think that there are a number of artists who are, who are in earnest that they want to produce something really beautiful, but they'll take an art class even in a, a college or university and they're taught to copy from a photograph, not from reality, not from this world where we can see the beauty of light striking an object. And, you know, photography basically destroys the light spectrum. It destroys um, all of the element of time. Like when you're observing a, a, a person, let's say you're painting a person, it takes time for you to kind of settle in and see what gestures are the most natural, the drapes that are the most beautiful on their clothing. And um, when you really sit with that, um, you end up with a very different product than just slavishly reproducing something that uh, some sort of mechanism has already compressed. Um, 
And now with Photoshop and all sorts of other resources, the problem is just amplified. Right. I mean, and that's that's the whole distinction between art and science, right? I mean, we're not we're, you're not just sort of reproducing something; you are creating something, mm -hmm. which is a, a different thing. And I really appreciate your insights there. Um, it's it's wonderful to hear, you know, somebody who really does it. I mean, I, I opine about all kinds of things, but I alas, I don't paint myself. Uh, although I probably I probably should give it a try. But it's really wonderful to hear from somebody who really does it. So thank you. Let's talk about your your painting and particularly the two paintings that are in the book. Um, the, as you mentioned before, your two uh, your two paintings are um, portraits of Saint Benedict and Saint Scholastica. Now, reading about you, I, I noticed that you. Uh, I think on your website it says that you you specialize in kind of a, a Renaissance and Baroque. Uh, style, which certainly you can see in these two portraits. I have to admit, the painter that I thought about when I saw your paintings was Diego Velasquez. Is he a big influence on you? Oh, I love him. But you know, when I look at his works, they're so they're so beautiful. I just feel like giving up. You know, it's just this like unattainable, extraordinary brushwork that um, that he's able to capture. That you know, you just feel like oh, it take a lifetime just to um, to to understand what he did. Um, but I have taken a lot of inspiration from his own example. And, you know, he was uh, an artist who continued to grow and develop as he got older. And so um, I, I, I take that to heart and say, OK, you know, now that I'm middle aged, I can I, I can't let up. I need to keep learning. And, um, you know, it's 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 something I think most artists feel this pull to sort of rest on your laurels to do what you have some success with and kind of stay away from um, harder challenges within creating a work of art. But since I often do commissions, I'm constantly asked to do things that are beyond my comfort zone. And it's, it's hard, but these are sort of the lessons that God is putting in my life. And with these particular paintings of Benedict and Scholastica, these were designated for altarpieces within a monastery for two side altars. And um, I just think that's the highest calling a painting can have, to have daily mass celebrated in front of it. Um, so one of the challenges was just the intimidation of needing to get this right. But um, I, I recognized the, the gravity of the, the call of these two paintings. And so I uh, actually found two siblings to model for Benedict and Scholastica. So there is some sort of um, uh, similarity between the characteristics of the models. And then I was also blessed to be able to borrow traditional Benedictine habits. And you'll notice particularly on the habit of St. Scholastica, her, her wimple has these very fine, thin, um, folds, uh, creases around her face. And there's only a couple of convents in the world that still fold their habits this way. It requires a special machine. And um, the nuns that I borrowed it from actually sent it in a box with photos and instructions on step-by-step -step how to put it on the model. So it was just, it was just fascinating because there's no book that you can find that says, how do you put on a nun's habit, you know, again, something that must be passed down person to person. Right. Wow, that's really fascinating. That reminds me of how badly in, in movies from time to time you'll see um, p uh, filmmakers try to kind of kit out churchy looking people and they'll make crazy mistakes like because they, they don't actually know, you know, how how a, a priest or a monk or a nun or something actually wears the, the clothes that they are typically clad in. So that is a really wonderful story. I, I'm, I didn't I didn't expect uh, hearing something like that. So that's wonderful. Um, you mentioned that the, the the models for Benedict and Scholastica that you had a real brother and sister, but the book actually mentions that you had a couple of other like more famous inspirations in in your mind when you were kind of de uh, depicting their faces. Will you tell us about those? That's right. Well, I was speaking with the. Um the uh, the abbot and he said that you know this this ideal man this the, that Benedict could sort of encapsulate um, needed to be you know kind of a combination of yeah Charlton Heston and John Wayne I forgot what some of the others were um, but uh, any time that I 
attempt to create a spiritual portrait, um, especially for saints that are living before we have, uh, you know, photography or anything like that. Um, it's funny. It's like certain shapes of eyes or brow or mouth or nose can sort of communicate uh, particular virtues and particular uh, level of just, I don't know, um, intelligence or personality. And the only way to really achieve that I've found is to sort of layer multiple um, multiple models, multiple sitters, and then also add to that just a little bit of um, adaptation uh, from imagination. And that's how you really arrive at the idealized portrait. And today we see a lot of sacred art that really does look like it was just a person off the street who's wearing a costume. And looking at the past, we say, uh, many artists were able to break away from that. And clearly they're looking to the natural world for inspiration, but there's also this like heavenly light or idealization that ends up imbuing everything. Yeah, yeah, and I wanna, I wanna hear about the this, this St. Uh, Scholastica inspirations as well, but this, to pause a moment on, on, uh, on the Benedict, you know, it's interesting because I, I would never looking at the portrait I don't see Charlton Heston there. So, I mean, you you obviously weren't trying to just, you know, put Charlton, like, oh, Charlton Heston's got a, a neat face. Let's let's make him St. Benedict, right? Or, you yeah. know, there are these sort of silly examples, right, of people who, maybe an old widow who wants her husband's face put on St. George or, or St. Michael the Archangel or something like that in a in a stained glass window or something like that. So that's that's far from what's going on in your painting. But I love the way that you describe how you know, just that that composite then of like of real humanity that, okay, we can sort of attach it to this person and that person, but that ultimately is your creation. Uh, I, I really appreciate your the way you explain that. Well, and also too, you know, I, I've done a number of St. Joseph's, a number of paintings of Our Lady. And what strikes me is that everyone has a different ideal of what a Christ might look like or what Our Lady might look like because she is the most beautiful creature ever created and Christ would be the most handsome man ever ever created um but in our mind's eye that ideal might look different and so I try to to reach out as close as possible to what um the patron's ideal is knowing that no matter what I'll fall short you know it's impossible it's impossible to ever um, attain to the the true beauty. So really, it's just um, it's just an indication. You know, it's just a pointing pointing heavenward, so that the viewer can say, "Well, as beautiful as this is, I know that the reality is even more beautiful." Yeah. Well, I would imagine with your skill, there's the the potential that you could create something. Maybe a, uh, your patron might have had something in mind, and and then they look at it and they say, "Ah, oh, that's even." That's 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 better than I imagine. That's that's different and more wonderful. You know, I mean, that's well, sort of that's, your task. Yeah. yeah, that's the beauty of working with a patron is that it's always a surprise. It, the painting never ends up the way that I think it's going to start, and and then I think the patron is always surprised also with how it ends up. And for both of us, um, the most successful projects are where we've left a little bit of space there to be surprised by inspiration or I think you know the Holy Ghost um, uh, comes in and you know can transform the most um, discouraging start to a painting you know uh, it's it's amazing how sometimes um, it just needed something totally unexpected yeah that's wonderful as for Saint Scholastica sorry I seem to have trouble spitting her name out um, it, it says in the book here that you modeled her after Grace Kelly, Sophia Loren, and Julia Child, yes. which I, I thought that was just wonderful. And again, I don't really see any one of those three in there, but what wonderful faces for me to, to, to have in my mind because they're so such memorable faces, you know? Yeah, and I think it's also, you know, it's sort of the, the personality of those different women where you think of, you know, Grace, Grace Kelly, absolutely gorgeous, very lovely, but also very, you know, just refined. Mm -hmm. Whereas Sophia Loren is is sort of this uh, quintessential Italian woman that has this this very uh, this warmth and femininity, um, and then Julia Child is this this 
lovely sense of humor. And, um, you know, you can almost think of her like um, as a personality that would be providing for all of her nuns uh, in a very um, generous and um, uh, probably delicious manner as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, tell us about about the, these re the real paintings. They are in, in Norcia in Italy? That's right, yes. And they are in um, antique frames that I think are about triple the size of the painting themselves. So, um, uh, you know, if a painting looks okay on its own, then the frame makes it look uh, like about 10 times better. And very sadly, I have not seen them in person. Um, several acquaintances of mine have gone, but um, it's sort of my life goal to get to see them in place. And um, it's a comfort to know that if I don't make it, they should still be there, you know, for my kids. Uh, so maybe someday they can visit. Um, but that's that's another element to sacred art that makes it so special is that um, within the timeline of the church, um, you know, this this idea that we're creating art not for ourselves, but for future generations and future millennia makes you really pause and say, wait a second, the materials all need to have uh, longevity and integrity. And the beauty needs to be not the beauty of our age, but the beauty of, of an eternal understanding. And yeah. right now I'm getting really interested in learning fresco. So that's what I'm dabbling in in the, the studio for a little bit. And seeing frescoes that are just as radiant as the day they were painted from 2000 years ago, um, that's something that I think gives would give any artist pause before they they start something like that. Yeah, what tell us about the materials of the of of these paintings and and also how large are they? Yeah, they're um, they're not too large. They're they're just kind of uh, life size. So if you just picture the head and shoulders of anyone, um, I think around sixteen by twenty. But um, they're painted in uh, on linen. And then, uh, and then stretched on on stretcher bars. But um, oftentimes, I paint on cotton canvas, and cotton canvas is an excellent surface. But it is more susceptible to changes in humidity, and um, linen has actually longer fibers than cotton does, and so it makes for a more even surface, and um, it makes for something even more archival. So just starting with Belgian linen, coating it with um, with gesso, which sort of protects and seals each fiber so that it can't decay from the back um, or decay from the oil paints. Then um, all the oils uh, are applied to the surface. And when that's uh, when the painting is done, it's it's varnished with a protective coat. And the varnish what this does is really beautiful. And I mention this because in the 1950s and 60s, it started to become in vogue to not varnish your paintings or to insist that um, to lie with a painting and make anything three dimensional is, um, uh, is, is bad and that we need to acknowledge the two dimensionality of the surface by making everything flat and matte. Um, when you apply a varnish, it allows the light to enter through the varnish, it hits the, the colors of the paint, reflects back and reflects again, uh, almost like a jeweled surface. And that's what makes oil paintings so luminous in person. And that's another quality that ends up being lost just with reproductions of paintings. Mm. Yeah, there really is nothing like, you know, seeing one of these, you know, seeing uh, Virgin on the Rocks or see, you know, seeing one of these sort of uh, amazing Renaissance paintings, they they do, they just have this yeah luminosity or something that just, you just can't replicate. You you have to see it. You really do. And yeah. that's our challenge right now. I, I just want to encourage so many people that, you know, it's like, we, I think collectively as society, we really need to um, have higher standards for, for taste and to develop our aesthetics by seeking out some of the most beautiful things um, to, uh, to, to travel, to go to our local art museum. And um, this is, requires effort. It's a little bit uncomfortable, but, um, but I think that's the only solution to fighting against the scourge of ugliness that we experience in everyday life.
Yeah. And the scourge, uh, yeah, one and one form of that ugliness, I would say, especially in a church context, is the scourge of kitsch. You yes. know, just this sort of uh, lowest common denominator, almost cartoon-like sort of thing, mm -hmm. which sadly, I, I just don't understand why so many churches just kind of go with the flow with that with that sort of thing. But I hope I hope maybe what you're doing will help uh, redress that 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 problem. Well, I wonder if part of it, I mean, a lot of it is sentimentality. You know, that's the real the heart of the problem with kitsch is it's this shortcut to emotions. Um, but I think that there are some people that are sort of visually deaf, like there could be the most beautiful Madonna or the ugliest. And for them, they just think about Our Lady and it doesn't really matter. Um, but God has given different people different sensitivities. And so for some people, they're very sensitive to music. And uh, if there's just trite music, you know, treacle playing overhead, it's going to affect their ability to pray. And I know as a young child, I, I would just devour the, the children's books that I had in the pew. And I still remember all of those images. So now as a mother of four, um, I think a lot about the images that they're looking at, the images in the church, and how it's affecting not just them, but all the other children and all of the other uh, people in the church who this is feeding their spiritual life. Yeah, you know, just as an aside, Gwyneth, that reminded me, to this day, when I think of certain scenes from the Bible, I, the images in my head are from the TV shows Superbook and Flying House. They, they're the, they were these Asian, I think Korean, but they have this kind of anime look to them. And um, there were these Bible stories and anyway, they were on in the 80s. And, and uh, so, yeah, so as you say, just the point I'm making is just to, you know, to kind of echo what you've said that, you know, the, the images that we expose our people to, the images that we consume uh, really do shape our, our our imagination, our understanding, and and heighten or 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 I guess the opposite could could happen uh, in terms of our devotion. So, um, yeah. And I think the idea of of fasting a bit visually is 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 an important one. Um, just getting really busy with homeschooling and kids. I just I hadn't watched movies in a while, and so then. I sat down with my husband, we watched a couple of things that I had seen before, and it was almost like they had changed in the last decade. And when you step away and then you come forward again, you say, oh, wait a second. It's almost like you're seeing for the first time. So I would encourage anyone that's interested in, you know, really hearing music to turn off the radio, like experience silence for a while before um, you then very intentionally listen to music in person. The same thing in the visual arts, the same thing with food. Obviously, um, if you have made an excellent Lent, your, your Easter is that much better. Yeah, and and maybe an example of how this works in the church is is traditionally the church would cover sacred images and cl close a, a triptych and not use the organ, you know, that sort of thing for a period of time leading up to the celebration of the resurrection, right? Where sort of the images and the sound and everything kind of comes alive again as if for the first time. And I think that that's building in, in popularity again. I'm so happy there is just such a resurgence in, in the arts and the appreciation at every possible level. Um, I'm very optimistic that we're going to be seeing, you know, Corpus Christi processions with um, flower petals everywhere and um, a, a, a population within the church that, that realizes that um, a beautiful altar is more important than functioning air conditioning or a good sound system. Yeah, I mean, it's time to stop being so utilitarian. You know, we're not it, we're not taking grace pills. We're not going to a mass factory. It's mm -hmm. it is a it's a much more holistic, humane experience, right? Living the Catholic faith, which requires this aesthetic side, very very much so. In fact, not not a side. I mean, it's integral to the entire to the entire life. Yeah. Well, yeah. we've just gotten soft. I don't know. It's one of mm -hmm. those things. Like, I don't know what the future holds, but we've seen some pretty crazy stuff in the last few years, and. I think the more that we can um, make intentional sacrifices now and sort of uh, toughen up, the more that we can look towards the future with um, a sense of, of grit and hope. 
Yeah, very well said. I couldn't agree more. One more thing about your work before I, I get your uh, your take on some of the other painters and their works in the book. I, I happen to notice on your website that you painted a portrait of St. Augustine for our late pontiff, uh, Benedict XVI. I, I know our listeners would love to hear about that. Could, could you just uh, tell us about that? Yes, it was, it was a really funny last minute project. A friend of mine, um, uh, who's a priest at an audience um, with Pope Benedict and he wanted to just give him a little something, little token, but he didn't tell me until very last minute. So there wasn't time for the oil paint to dry on any project. And I knew I had to um, switch medium. So I, I did a portrait of St. Augustine in, uh, in watercolor. And um, yeah, very, very stressful making all of the elements come together, but I was able to uh, borrow an Augustinian habit and the Pontificalia um, to place on a model and then work from life to put together a little something. Um, I think right at that time I got really sick with a fever and couldn't find the frame, but somehow it came together and everything worked out. And um, yeah, it was such uh, such a privilege. And I was especially grateful because um, it was Pope Benedict that was really instrumental in my husband coming back to the church before I even met him. So it was sort of a way that I could say um, to say thank you to the late pontiff. Well, um, are, just out of curiosity, I mean, I know St. Augustine is, it was maybe uh, Pope Benedict's greatest theological hero and influence. Was that, was that part of why you painted that or what, or was that what was asked of you? Yeah, no, that was, that was exactly, um, that was exactly the intent. And um, so in the, in the painting, um, there's, uh, I've depicted him actually holding his, his, his sort of uh, jeweled gloved hand um, over his heart. And then the heart within is, is glowing between the fingers and, um, uh, you know, pointing towards the, the famous quote of St. Augustine, our, our hearts are restless until they, until they rest in thee. Wow, that's wonderful. Well, I certainly would encourage our, our listeners and viewers to go to your website and uh, and see the photograph of Pope Benedict looking at your painting. What a wonderful moment that must have been for you to see that that picture of him appreciating your work. Yeah, I mean, who knows? Maybe he put it in the closet after that, but um, in that moment, he very uh, obviously a very gracious, gracious man. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, Gwyneth, you are one of nine artists in in this book, uh, 18, 18 portraits total, and um, they are mostly portraits of canonized saints. There are a few that are um, kind of um, people on the way to, to uh, canonization or maybe people that we hope might be one day. Um, but uh, let's talk about some of the other paintings and some of the other, uh, some of the other artists here. Um, now, some of them I would say maybe are you know, somewhat in the same kind of tradition that you're that you're working in. Um, one of those might be uh, Bernadette Car Carstensen, I believe. Um, what, are you familiar with her work? And maybe you could tell us about the paintings that she has in the in the collection. Yes, um, I'm a great admirer of Bernadette. She is um, located on the West Coast and has been doing just really beautiful illustration for a long time. Um, the thing that really inspires me is that she does not um she does not cut any corners um so many of her works are um just so intricate so many details you can just see the the hours that she's poured into it and really the the love of subject matter too um so yeah she's one of a number of of living artists that i've had the privilege to just sort of connect with over the last few years and um uh, a number of the artists within the gallery are included in a directory that my husband and I founded a few years ago called the Catholic Artists Directory. And oh. so this is a great way for, um, for people who are interested in learning more about living professional Catholic artists to just click right through to their websites and reach out to them. Wow, that sounds like a wonderful resource. I'm, I'm glad that, you, that you've done that. That's wonderful. Um, just incidentally, Karstensen's two paintings for, for our listeners um, are one is a, a wonderful painting of St. Joseph, and the other is a really striking portrait of, St of Our Lady of Stella Maris, a really beautiful kind of image of her standing in the water um, with these sort of columns. 
uh, around her. Uh, I, I, I really love that painting. It's, it's really beautiful. So I know our, our listeners will want to look at that. There's such inventiveness. I know when I first started thinking, oh, I might want to be an artist. I just thought, oh, but everything's already been painted. There's been, you know, hundreds of enunciations. And um, at first, when you start painting, you realize you're like, I'm just sort of reproducing things I've already seen. But as you delve further, and especially as you start to look at the work of other artists, you see that there's just endless inventiveness possible and that this is the source of all creativity is is god's design and so um uh yeah it, bernadette is a, is a great example uh, a couple of other artists in here maybe maybe very different um so uh, from your style for example there there's a, an artist in here called matthew alderman i was not familiar with his work there these are um these black and white drawings, I think, um, a very different style. Uh, you know, I don't know if you have any comments about about that. Well, and I know Matthew Alderman, uh, he, he is a, an architect by training and you can just see um, his love of form. And I think his works always make me think of the beautiful um, missiles and things from the past where there's mm -hmm. these small black and white line drawings that just bring the text to life. Well, um, I, I really, I, I I know when our listeners uh, purchase the book and and start looking through it, they will, I'm sure, gravitate towards. You know, we we've only touched on a few of the uh, of the paintings and the artists here. That there may be others that we haven't talked about that they'll really gravitate towards. There there are all different styles represented here, and um, that to me is is something hopeful to just remember that there are different um, there are different styles that that are still you know. Um, there are different ways, I suppose, that you know that this really high-level beauty can can be expressed. And um, so, I hope that our, you know that people listening, maybe who are themselves artists, who aren't maybe a part of of this group yet, will will sort of take heart from that and know that the church needs all different kinds of of, of talents. And um, I guess you know my last question for you would just be kind of with that in mind. Uh, what can we expect from you in the future? What what kinds of projects are you working on now? Oh, I've I've been blessed to, with a lot of exciting things coming up. A lot of uh, larger scale canvases, and I I love to work really big. So um, right now in, in my studio, I've just finished an underpainting for um, a large formal portrait of Saint Francis de Sales. Um, over the next year, I'm going to be doing a painting of Saint Thomas More. Um, Supper at Emmaus, um, and um, yeah, several other saints, including St. Dorothy, and a very large scene that I'm about halfway through is a vision that St. Joan of Arc um, had near her home of Dom Remy, where there's a, sort of a sacred conversation. Um, but yeah, just a kind of a final thought on the, the portfolio from Ignatius. My, my hope is that it really serves as this portal uh, for this world of living Catholic artists. And it can serve as a, as a point of hope for so many people who feel that perhaps art is dead. And to, to, to know that there are people out there who they can patronize, but also if they are aspiring artists to say, this is possible. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's really a sign of hope right now. Yeah, well, well said, and and uh, those who pick up the book will be able to find out more about the artists featured. Um, many of them, like you, have websites, or they, uh, you know, there are places to go to find out more about um, other other works that they've done besides the ones who are here that are here in in the book. The book is called "The Catholic Home Gallery: Eighteen Works of Art by Contemporary Catholic Artists." Now available wherever you get your books from Ignatius Press. My guest has been Gwyneth Thompson Briggs, whose work you can admire in this book and also at her website, GwynethThompsonBriggs.com. Gwyneth, thank you so much for taking the time to join me on the Ignatius Press Podcast. Thanks for having me, Andrew.